some kind of eclipse on Sunday. But uh, regardless of that, uh, given the COVID situation, we won't do it outdoors and, uh, you know, meeting in person, but we'll do it all as a webinar type of thing. And those who wish to join can join from home. And uh, uh, the program is basically eight to nine on Sunday. And we've also very fortunately been able to rope in one of the great uh, living uh, Yogacharyas. His name is Raghu Anantanarayanan. And he has learned from Krishnamacharya himself and also has very interesting uh, uh, contacts and experiences over several years with the late J. Krishnamurti. And uh, I've invited him because he's also doing an international yoga program with participants from all over the world. But we are doing a collaboration with him. And I thought that he could talk a little bit about, you know, stress and anxiety. Kafi ko stress and anxiety bhi ho rahi hai is dauran. To wo aakhir mein aake iske baare mein kuch batayenge. And there'll be a yoga workshop with pranayam and asans that we can do from home, which uh, Gayatri ji will conduct like last year. Shuruat mein I'll say a few words possibly. So eight to nine ye program tha humare man mein that we shouldn't lose India's soft power advantage, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Yoga day of the Just the actually, yoga vase apne aap hi karna parta hai eventually. Public performance to thik hai. Or jahatak public performance raha to China ko koi beat ni kar sakta. To lakho logo ko orchestrated performance karwa sakte hai. Uh, puri choreography ke saath. To hum log India gate ke pass karte hai. Usse bhi wo agar chahe wo. तो बहुत जबरदस्त करवा सकते हैं लेकिन जो योग में अंतरंग साधना होती है बाहरी अंग तो होता ही है लेकिन अंतरंग है भीतर की जो साधना है मेरे हिसाब से अष्टांग योग में आसन से उसका महत्व कई ज्यादा है हम तो आसन पे ही ज्यादा जोर देते हैं तो कुछ उसके बारे में भी शायद बात हो सकती है रविवार को तो ये सबको मैं सूचना देना चाहता था अभिनंदन शुभकामनाएं और बधाई देना चाहता हूं अच्छे काम के लिए कंटिन्यूटी के लिए बहुत-बहुत धन्यवाद सर आपका आशीर्वाद हो तो अच्छा है हम तो यही चाहते हैं कि हमेशा सदगुरु का आशीर्वाद रहे सहयोग रहे क्योंकि इंस्टीट्यूट की रौनक तो फेलोज की वजह से ही है हम हमारी एकेडमिक कम्युनिटी है जब हम आपस में बात करते हैं तो ऊर्जा बढ़ती है और मेधा भी बढ़ती है अब मेधा जी बैठी हैं तो मैं उनकी बात <laughs> जो इनकी शक्ति जो है <laughs> तो मैं तो कहूंगा कि हमारा सौभाग्य है कि दुनिया में जो कोविड के कारण संक्रमण है वो इतना बढ़ता जा रहा है लेकिन शिमला में हम रिलेटिवली मुझे लगता है सुरक्षित हैं और आईएएस जैसी जगह में हर भी जा सकते हैं थोड़ी सावधानी के साथ लेकिन काफी लोग डिप्रेस क्योंकि वो कहीं जा नहीं पाते उनको तो हां अपने बिल्डिंग के बालकनी में भी जाना अब गवारा नहीं है लोगों ने उस पे भी रुकावट डाल दी है रोक डाल दिया है तो ऐसे हालात में हम लोग अपने आप को कुछ खुश नसीब भी समझे तो ठीक है we can start sir now. Um, uh, uh, Professor Rajvir ji, shuru kiya jaya, ijazat hai? Haan, sir. <laughs> sir, sir, sir. Sir, he, sir, he is ahad dhe Thank you. Thank you. Baut, baut, dhanayat. Uh, friends, I'm really delighted uh, to welcome everybody in today's Thursday seminar to the final presentation of uh, Dr. Satendra Kumar. Now, all of us know him, uh, and uh, he has been, uh, you know, the fellows representative, fellows council representative, uh, and uh, has been extremely active academically uh, in IIAS. But more than that, his presence has brought a certain kind of seriousness to, uh, you know, academic pursuits on IIAS. He's, he's a fine scholar. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know much about his work till last year. 
when an extraordinary book of his came out, Badalta Gaon, Badalta Dehat, Nai Samajik Ta Uday, Nai Samajik Ta Ka Uday. Ye Hindi me chapi Oxford ki kitab, itni zavardas kitab hai, uski likne ki shali bhi kuch adbut hai. So, when I was reading this book, I have a book that I thought was that this is a new way to do it. It is a new way to do it and to understand it. It is a new way to understand it. It is a new way to understand it. It is a new way to understand it. It is a new kind of sociality, if I may use that word. It is a very, very important contribution to our self-understanding. So, when I was reading it, some of you were there, you might remember. Yes. And uh, since, then, since then, I have tried to engage more with his work, and I find it's full of a kind of creativity, which, uh, which I think is very important. And uh, rather than speaking in generalities, let me you know, uh, point to something that I found in his presentation abstract today, mm -hmm. where uh, essentially, Satendra Ji is calling for nothing short of a new anthropology of democracy. Now, what does that mean, an anthropology of democracy? I think this is a, a wonderfully inviting and uh, stimulating and provocative mission statement for a, for a scholar in their midlife career, you know, in the middle of their career. Why do I think it is important? Let me, let me try to explain what, why I think this is important. Now, all of us know that we are in the middle of this uh, raging pandemic, which has uh, infected more than 4 million people across the world and, and uh, also caused the deaths of several hundred thousand people. And uh, we also have talked right here in IIAs of a new emerging world order and so forth. Now, what has democracy to do with it? And why do we need a new anthropology for democracy? This was the question I actually asked myself, you know, just accidentally, when I was thinking about COVID management. In other words, do authoritarian societies like China manage epidemics better than democratic societies manage uh, uh, epidemics? And now look at this border confrontation between China and India. It is almost as if the world is being asked to choose between two systems of governance, two systems of politics, two systems of society, in fact. And it is tempting for people to think that, look, if we were run by an authoritarian regime, the number of infections would have been less, we could have managed the pandemic better. But here's the contra argument. The fact is, as far as I know, that we really don't know what happens in authoritarian societies. We actually don't even know how many people are infected. In Wuhan, there are private reports that uh, several hundred thousand coffins and urns for ashes were ordered. When you cremate a body, the ashes are taken in an urn, and then the family is given you know, the remains, the mortal remains of the loved one. In other words, uh, the, the control over information makes it difficult to actually believe the claims that authoritarian societies manage pandemics better. But let's move away from pandemics for a moment and look at the challenges. That's why I said, why is the a new anthropology for democracy important? Because you see, how do we, let's leave aside China, as I said, and come back, cross the disputed border where on the paper it's a huge dash and the dash on the ground translates into 30, 40 kilometers. So we don't know where the actual line of control is on the ground, but let's cross over to our own side. And right, right now during the pandemic, you know, one big question was how does a democratic uh, polity manage the crisis that we saw with migrants, because our workers are also so important to us, and their movement can be controlled by clamp it like an authoritarian society. Think about the declaration of the lockdown, you know, where we had almost 98, 97% success without 
specially coercive methods. And here is the opening uh, statement in uh, Satyendraji's uh, abstract, where he talks about India's silent revolution, you know, where the, as it were, the underclasses have risen in India. And in the community he's studying, the Gujars are classified as an OBC in some places, even SC in other places, uh, other states. We know how, how these classifications have changed uh, and, and again, crossing of borders, you get a completely different uh, social and sociological profile of communities such as the Gujars. Some places, they are very well settled, landed communities, and other places, they are still nomadic. And there is the British tag of the so-called criminal and nomadic tribes as well. Now, when Satendraji looks at, uh, you know, the methodology and the apparatus to understand a community like this, he raises this very important question of a new, so, you know, sociality which, with, with which I started, that the underclass is risen. And this defies the conventional wisdom you know, in social sciences. What is the conventional wisdom? That if you have tremendous social disparity, right, and tremendous social diversity, which you have in India, and you also have uh, a lot of poverty, then economic development doesn't happen easily. Whereas in controlled societies, like say South Korea, which do not have so much diversity and so much variety, you know, and so much inequality, you can develop very fast. So I think energy starts with a very interesting premise that goes counter to the conventional wisdom in social sciences and then says, can we account for it? And to account for it, he's proposing a new anthropology of democracy. And as I have suggested, this is really important for the new and emerging world order post-COVID, because it is democratic countries where the pandemic has raged, whether it is Italy, whether it is UK, or whether it is the United States today, where if you tell somebody to stay at home, they'll shoot you, so to speak. You know, the fundamental liberties, you know, are so important. And here is where, when I come to another aspect that I see in this project, which is really fascinating, where I think my humble suggestion, Satendraji, that you can possibly develop this. You know, Satendraji has talked about the competitive politics of the underclasses in India. We have seen the rise of, you know, intermediate communities and castes, both BC, OBC, you know, what we would call, you know, communities such as the Reddies, you know, the Patels in Gujarat, the Marathas, the Kapus, and, uh, you know, the Gounders, the Gaudas, there are the Yadavas and all, intermediate communities which have become extremely powerful. So they have thrived where, where it comes to competitive politics. They are managing, uh, you know, their community interests in such a wonderful way uh, and in a democratic system including using, as Satendraji says, certain extra legal, even criminal, uh, you know, uh, you might say devices, uh, uh, that kind of democratic uh, setup, mobilizing private armies, capturing booths, whatever it is, and usurping on the one hand, though we shouldn't say usurping, but really appropriating the privileges traditionally associated, say, with the Kshatriyas or but the more learned other Brahmin type communities. So, in a way, there is a Sanskritization to use Amin Srinivas's fa favorite uh, or famous, I would say, term. But on the other hand, you see that when they assume power, it is these intermediate communities who also end up enforcing their rule over the Dalits and the, and the communities which are beneath them. So here's another paradox of the new sociality as we were talking about. But what I was thinking is that just to bring in the comparison with the United States, where competition in a democratic system in, the, in, the, uh, in, in America, in an advanced capitalist society, is between individuals. Individuals compete and rise. But I think if I were to ventilate the subtext of Satendraji, here it is communities compete and rise. So there is an incredible social mobility in India, not so much of individuals. There are some stray individuals like, say, the Ambani's, 
you know, or uh, you know, the Narayana Murthy's, uh, Kiran Muzumdar Shah, others who in one generation have risen to the top. So, but those are exceptions. What we see in, you know, the anthropology of Indian democracy is a churn, is a social churn in which, in a competitive politics of a democratic polity, it is communities which rise, not individuals necessarily. And of course, when communities rise, individuals who form the communities also rise with them. So here is the Indian inflection to a new anthropology of democracy. And I wanted to, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person as, as an academic, as somebody in the humanities and social studies, I always look for an excitement that comes from a turn of phrase. How is an idea expressed? So let me quote something that Satyendraji has written. He talks about this new, how to account for the new political, this Rajniti, you know, or politics as we understand it. And he says, it is, we have to see it as an essential, I'm quoting him, as an essential but necessary, indeterminate, unpredictable, and uncontainable expression of democratic modernity in India. I like this sentence because uh, I think it's fantastic. I'll tell you why in a moment. Ethnographic attention to the idea of the political as a site of riotous and unruly cultural production may, Sikindraji suggests, encourage the ongoing renewal of the anthropology of politics and democracy. Now, you see, this sentence, these two sentences for me are uh, the mark of a, of a very creative mind. You know, which is who is thoughtful, uh, you know, who, who considers issues deeply and is going to produce new knowledge. And I might submit uh, to Satyendraji, I mean, what he's really saying is look at the energy of Indian democracy, which makes it predictable, indeterminate. It's going to throw up new forms, new expressions, you know, and new kinds of cultural production. And this is the challenge, you know of democracy to anthropology. The last thing I wanted to say is that, you know, as we were growing up, we always thought that it is disciplines such as ours, whether it's anthropology, sociology, literary studies, political science, and so on, history, etc., which would in some ways, you know, not only support, throw light, you know, help us understand Indian democracy, because somehow Indian democracy was always seen a juba, you know, to usko strengthen karna hai. Jamuriyat, you know, lok tantra ko yahan sadhred karna hai. Kyunki it was all, we, people thought Indian democracy was very fragile, you know. I was growing up in the 70s, you know, there was the emergency. And somehow we felt that all these disciplines <coughs> would help strengthen Indian democracy and democratic institutions of India. But I submit to you, that today it is actually the other way. It is Indian democracy that can realize threatened and marginalized disciplines such as anthropology. It is Indian democracy that can give new energy and new directions and new momentum to anthropology because these are tired and I would say jaded disciplines all over the world. And it is in trying to understand the, the new epistemies thrown up by Indian democracies, that democracy that some of our own disciplines can be re-energized and, uh, and can get a new will uh, to live. Thank you. With these words, uh, I think this will be Satyendraji's last uh, presentation. We can't have a formal farewell because of COVID, but I wish him all the best. I think he has made a great contribution, uh, you know, to his discipline and also to the community in IIAS. And I wish him all the best. I'm sure all of us will wish him all the best. And uh, he, I think we will hear more of him in the years and decades to come. With these words, Satyendraji, all yours. But I hand over the proceedings to the chair today, uh, our own, uh, you know, uh, should I say beloved, and very learned uh, uh, Rajvi Sharma ji. Sir, uh, please conduct Kiji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, the kind of very enlightening remarks 
that you have given. You have, in fact, made my task much more easy. And uh, in fact, uh, I have nothing to add after you have uh, given this introduction to his research, except that it's a, it's a departure from a conventional study. And uh, he is trying to, in fact, um, question the conventional theories of democracy and is bringing a new aspect of interpreting democracy and also interpreting the society of India. And uh, in fact, there have been so many studies on caste and uh, religion on macro level, that is true. And micro level also, there have been so many studies uh, beginning from M.N. Srinivas to so many others, even G.S. Gurye and uh, A.R. Desai, uh, so many others have done it. Uh, the the uh, foreigners have also conducted village studies to that account. But the problem uh, is not that uh, it, is, it is another study. No, it is something different where he's trying to reinterpret the role of ethnicity and also culture. He has brought the issues of culture and ethnicity in the power politics and, and the democratic politics. I think this will give a new direction to uh, the democratic processes and the understanding of the democratic processes in India, particularly in the, in the understanding of the politics of the marginalized. So I don't have to say much to, in addition to what you have given such a wonderful introduction to his uh, research. I would just like to say a few words about uh, him as an academic and uh, as, a, as a scholar. Uh, I think many of us know that he has uh, produced uh, so many uh, so many articles and books. And as you referred rightly, one of the books is, uh, that is Badalta Gaon, Badalta Dehat, uh, Nai Samajikta Ka Uday. I think th this has been selected already for an award by, uh, by the uh, uh, REC WOW Book Awards 2019, and also NEST Book of the Year, Indian Languages also. So, his, uh, his intellect has been recognized already in so far as his approach to the study of rural areas is concerned and how the new uh, societies, the marginalized societies are trying to assert uh, for the share participation. In fact, two or three aspects he has touched about political participation, political mobilization and political socialization. These three aspects have been very well uh, brought in uh, so far as the analysis of his research uh, subject is concerned. Now, b b besides that, uh, Dr. Satendra uh, Kumar has been a product of that university. I'm proud of it uh, because I belong to that university. He uh, did his PhD from Delhi School of Economics and he has been awarded uh, the British Academy Fellowship. He was London School of Economics and Political Science, UK. He has also been a visiting fellow at the Johns Hopkins University, also at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSPS, a very uh, you know, renowned center for these, uh, the studies of the society and politics in India. And uh, he has been also at the University of California as a visiting fellow, Berkeley, and Bellsfield University, Germany, Savitri Bhai Phule University, Pune. He has been a visiting fellow to so many national and international universities as the uh, biodata suggests. And uh, he has been in fact a student of anthropology and sociology. Therefore, he is the beneficiary of combining the research tools of both sociology as well as anthropology. Uh, with these words, um, I welcome you, sir, to present your uh, your research, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, uh, I would say thank you very much, Professor Ma, accepting the chairing this session, and this immense uh, you know privilege for me. And thank you so much, Professor Makran Paranjpe. I think uh, uh, you made me what I am not actually, giving such a big. Uh, uh, into to this presentation and I think you have raised bar so high I don't know whether I can live up to that or not this is big challenge writing and I was remembering once when you were talking to me and we were talking and you told me three things 
and just stuck to me in my mind how to understand India. You told me three things, fact, fable and wisdom. And I remembered it. It's such an insight you gave me. I, I kept thinking about it. And only professor like you can tell that. Because it's a very thoughtful idea how we combined fact, fable and uh, wisdom and make a story which can comprehend or understand this diversity or such a you know diverse country like India. So I don't know if I can do that and uh, if I can fulfill that promise, but it's a learning, it's a beginning for me. How can I engage with scholars like you who has a who has well read there's no competition I, I can't uh, you know you know stand before you because in reading and writing you have written 50 books and you have been such an inspiring director here in the institute i think for all of us yes. and directly or indirectly it's not like every time we engage directly but you know persona of person the way you walk or, or a director behave or the way you kind of you know introduce speakers introduce seminars it has been very learning how to summarize our ideas so i don't know if i can fulfill this my promise you feel the way you have uh, uh, remade me through this presentation <laughs> uh, this uh, but i will be always thankful and and oblige you have given us such a wonderful place to work and since you have been there Institute has been very, very vibrant. You brought a lot of new energy, positive energy to the Institute. People have been very, I think uh, we all always look up to you and want to do something new. And this, my presentation is part of that. Being here, learning from everyone, those old fellows who have left also and those who are here. And my learning process is always, many people say, this person has taught me or that person has taught me. This is one way. But I, one can also learn silently. One can also learn indirectly. This is also learning or listening somebody or watching somebody. That is also part of learning. And the IAS provide that kind of ambience where we can also interact directly. And we can also withdraw and stay in our rooms or library and can learn through listening people, through informal conversation, through their writings, to reading their books. So that is a, it's a wonderful place, IAS, and I think we all have this responsibility to protect it and to make it a better institute and better and better and better. And I think we are doing this in, under your leadership. So thank you, sir, very much. And I also thank you, everyone. I don't know if I will have a chance, but uh, all fellows who, uh, I mean, current and those who have left also. I have learned a lot from everyone differently as my philosophy is very like I learn differently. Indirectly, indirectly listening them, reading them or having informal chat with them, something. So everybody has contributed immensely to this project. If I begin with, I started with uh, the project uh, Professor Singh is sitting here. He knows that when I presented first time, it was a comparative study between two caste groups, Sanis and, and Gujars. But once I, when I presented this, then many uh, fellows gave suggestion, ki it seems too big and it's difficult how to manage it. And then I realized if I take a one caste study, that may be better to highlight the cultural component of a caste and how this caste refashion all cultural, uh, uh, cultural components and participate in democracy and remake the democracy for themselves, then might be a possibility to make a sense and make a clear argument. Because there's huge material around I have collected in the last 10 years and it has been challenged how to combine this uh, with theory, this material with ethnographic notes, literature, caste histories and interviews. So it's a huge data I have collected around the caste literature, how caste, you know, rewriting their histories, how they are producing a particular kind of a culture in print culture and also remaking the public spaces. 
putting up statues, putting up a uh, name of uh, uh, these intersections or redefining the roads. And that, that material was impossible to put together. But anyway, I will try. It's like a, we have already, uh, uh, already there are 3.30. So I will try to combine 30, 40 minutes what I'm trying to do. So a little bit uh, uh, background of this project is, as Professor Sharma and Professor Paranjpe already spoken, but just I will give quickly, how we understand the rise of uh, quote unquote lower caste or marginalized groups in politics and how we how should we understand and th this is the larger question so i put this project into a background of a larger democratic uh, democratization theories in which uh, modern political theories or conventional theories which we call they kind of questions India as a democratic country or where a democratic can su succeed. This is the larger literature which I begin with. And once democracy, uh, so now question is then why and how democracy has been successful or not successful, whatever you want to say. What are the processes? So there are huge literature. I'm sure those who are polit familiar with political science, they know the, uh, the, how democracy has unfolded and uh, uh, the landmark studies are done by Rudolf and uh, in uh, uh, 67 in late and, and uh, Kothari. And they have given this interesting and very, very useful thesis how caste modernize. In fact, how tradition is modernized and caste has become a vehicle of uh, democratic mobilization or social mobilization. And in so that has been a kind of a landmark and after a lot of studies has been done a role of caste, caste identity. So this is a one set of literature which comes out and we are familiar with that. What is interesting, uh, uh, I think, uh, which was not discussed is that when democracy enters into a different socio-cultural setting, what happens to democracy? This is one question. We are talking about the change and transformation of caste as a modern identity. But we have, so there is a, uh, there's not much literature in India telling what happens to democracy, institution, an institution which comes from somewhere else in 1947. So once democracy comes and interact with the different sort of diversities in India, one of them is caste, religion or region or ethnicity, what happens to democracy? So I'm trying to do when democracy and caste interaction, two institutions, so what they make of each other. So I'm trying to say it, they in, reshape each other. The caste no longer remains as what we think about the traditional caste system in a hierarchy. It start transforming either into Samaj, I call Samajikaran or ethnicity or ethnic like a identity in which bringing together of sub caste and clans become more important means reproduce uh, reprodu uh, producing the numbers or making the majority that is what important in the democracy so caste started become bringing together sub caste clan lineages and trying to form a homogeneous caste identity or ethnic group sort of emerges. And I have one chapter on that. So this is one. But what happened also democracy? What caste does to democracy? So how this, it seems to me what I have, uh, come, uh, I will explain later, but just I'm giving a little summary so that it helpful. So what happens to democracy is that people in the understanding of democracy, what I'm trying to say, the local cultural factors are very important. Means, like this is steady focus on Western UP and caste is a reality of that region. So major caste groups are Jat, Gujars, uh, Tyagis and you, you see Brahmins, Rajputs. They are the major groups and there are other groups also are there lower OBCs where you have artisan caste, you have SCs and SCs. 
so when democracy enters into that domain how caste user sort of i would say how caste appropriate the language of democracy one 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 possible uh, one thing i'm trying to say this second thing how they connect it with their past or what you can call cultural resources in which they have deities or a patron or kul devtas or the ways of their worship is how redefined through that and the attempt is that they want to produce more numbers which has the key to change democracy or insert into the de democratic politics so whole attempt is that how to unify the caste and whatever there is possible they try to do so the one is marriage practices which is very interesting how marriage they rearrange the marriage patterns how they rearrange also their gods so new gods emerge how they relate with the past and gods so the connection between god and human becomes seamless is become almost like god is a human so you can transform human being to god and god become a human and i think these are the areas which help to redefine democracy that is what i'm trying to do in this and i don't know how much i'm successful uh, but uh, but uh, so what i will do i will present a chapter so that you can get the sense what i'm trying to do and how i'm, I'm doing and then i can conclude uh, after that and i will uh, certainly beg uh, i mean i, I re request you to so kindly give some constructive criticism or constructive suggestion so that i can improve the presentation or my book further so uh, uh, so this chapter is i call is a chapter 4 and this chapter its title is hero gods kings and rebels in the making of gujar political culture what this chapter does how gujar political leaders caste associations ordinary gujars middle class ordinary how they connect their gods their uh, heroes with the modern political leaders and how this connection is uh, uh, established so i take three case studies sort of in this uh, this chapter is divided into three parts so when i begin with the god devnarayan is the god of the gujar day uh, gujar community and i have written one separate chapter on the emergence of the devnarayan as a uh, gujar deity in western up so i begin with one devnarayan how god is appropriate in everyday language of political participation and how they connect with the past so this is one section on god and kings second section is about how they create martial or revolutionary essence means they bring they try to highlight the role of gujar freedom fighters in 19 uh, 1857 and this has been written a lot professor patel has written i mean he i think he is one of the pioneer who has written about it in 50, uh, 1857 and the role of uh, uh, i mean caste he uh, heroes or those who were neglected and not has been uh, uh, given the due respect this is a interesting part how a community which has been labeled as a criminal tribe and they suddenly or they try to find out these freedom fighters who has contributed to 1857 war against british and this is very important and you might be knowing uh, the everybody knows mangal pande was uh, you know told the revolutionary of 1857 who started the first war of independence but gujars have established it was not a, a, a mangal pande but it was a dhansing kotwal actually who started and uh, this has a lot huge ramification around the meerut and uh, government has set up a statue in police line and a chapter of uh, police training uh, in in the in the uh, 
police training uh, institute one chapter is included of his role in uh, in the syllabus so this is a, a second section I, I will tell you in detail and the third i take how the political rhetoric of killing of vishal dev so this is also interesting so the dev narayan bhagwan who is now aradhya dev of gujars uh, in Rajasthan, uh, Professor Hada is here because I, I, he helped me a lot when we talked and his one of his student, his student, I think, gave me a lot of very interesting information about Devnaran. So they have this Bag, uh, Bagadavat Bharat, which is like a Mahabharat. It is a, it's a um, uh, epic in uh, Rajasthan and it has been uh, uh, performed during uh, like almost it takes sometimes six months to go on and it's a kind of a biggest epic. In, in Rajasthan. So it's called Bhagavad uh, Bharat. And in that uh, uh, in that epic, it's very interesting what it, uh, they do. Uh, the killing of Vishal Dev, who, uh, who was a kind of perpetrator, who was a Rajput king, and he uh, is stolen cows, and they have uh, do a lot of uh, atrocities against Gujars. So finally, Dev Narayan is uh, I have uh, shown his uh, incarnation of Lord Vishnu. He he, uh, he take birth uh, and he killed uh, Vishal Dev. This festival has not been part of Western UP. This is interesting part. How is transport from Rajasthan to Western UP? And in last ten uh, the last ten years, this become a festival. It is a part of like Gujar culture, and they uh, in November they. After Diwali, they perform this ritual as a notanki, as a part of that. And this is a very, very interesting to me how something which used to be part of Rajasthan culture suddenly become also part of uh, uh, Western UP. And people even, they don't want to talk about it. They think, yeah, it's a part of Ramlila. So this is, uh, I like, so, and then the, uh, the fourth section, I try to talk how the God and a strong political leadership can have a relationship or the way Dev Narayan is assumed or imagined, the certain quality people expect to be in their modern political leaders. And there's a where the crux lies, how they meet together. Ancient or mythical and real and everyday. This is what I'm trying to do in this chapter. And this is the same sort of a structure goes around the all chapters. Whether it's a rise of uh, Devanaran God or whether rise of, uh, um, you know, rearranging marriage practices, this all goes in the same direction. So I will, what what I do, so give a little bit a snapshot so that you can get it. On August 24, 2013, a, a two-day event was organized by the Gujar Vikas Manch and Akhil Bharatiya Gujar Mahasabha to celebrate the now newly constructed Gujar Bhavan at Pratapur Merit. The Bhavan facilitate, uh, facilitate include guest accommodation with 40 rooms, a multi-purpose hall with a capacity of 300 person, an open-air auditorium for 600 person and a Varha temple. So Varha is the incarnation of Lord Vishnu. With the Mihir Bhoj, and Lord Vishnu statue. So they are all put together. This is interesting. One side is a Varami, uh, uh, Pratihar King uh, Mihir Bhoj. On the other side, there is a Varha picture. Gujar political leaders were present, including Karori Basla, Avtar Singh Bhadana, Hukam Singh Gujar. During the two day conference, Gujar politicians from different political parties are different. Uh, and different regions address an audience of thousands of people. The event was well published and media were also well represented. One day event was uh, dedicated to Mihir Bho Jayanti and Sarva Samaj which included a section of other backward classes. This is a standard practice in Gujars today, uh, caste association meetings. Despite common allegations labeled against the Gujar leadership being casteist, Gujar social and political activist, 
make it a point to portray their political involvement to the media as part of the other backward classes and pastoral tribes struggle for social justice and not just as a Gujar caste. AVGM Akhil Bharati Gujar Mahasabha invites the leaders and representatives of Banjara, Lavana and Gadaria caste, caste to its caste association meetings and share the manch with them. And I am intensely using the word manch because if we want to understand the political theatre in India or democracy, manch is a very important component of our democracy. Because who will sit on the manch? Manch ki sardari kon karega? This is a very important concept. And we need to understand these uh, uh, vernacular concept which feed into the democratic uh, mobilization in, in India. In the last 15 years, I met politicians as Gujar, uh, at Gujar Kas Association meetings who during previous interviews expressed negative views about the relationship between caste, caste association and politics. In public, if you ask somebody, uh, are you only supporting your caste, they will never accept. They say, no, no, caste is very bad, we should not do it. We, we should be inclusive. But we all know there is a something behind it. And that is the interesting part of that. So they, if you publicly ask, I, I ask that, it's a Gujar Association meeting, they will say, we all invite all Sar Samaj. Though they, it's, a, it's a Gujar caste meeting. This is to show that at the end of the day, the support of caste association is still important. But, but and the Gujar voters are the most trustful. So what they do, they don't tell it openly, but they will definitely try to bring Gujar voters together. During caste association meeting, I often notice that Gujar politicians are reminded by ordinary Gujars that they need to work for their caste mates if they wish to be supported and voted. So many times whenever a political leader deviate from the path and say, I am, I am representing Sav Samaj, but then whenever he comes out from the manch, comes down, then definitely people tell that you are our leader and you have to work for our, our caste. So it's an it's a inter, interesting inter interaction between how you have a caste and claiming publicly caste but not to claiming publicly caste. It's a kind of contradictory. You say it's a Gujar association meeting. He say, nee, nee, hum to sab logu bulate hai. We are all hum caste is nahi hai. But behind the back everybody talking ki dekho ye Gujaro ka show hai. So you know, you see, is this play is very interesting to understand what people say and what people do. So what is rhetoric actually? So important is rhetoric. So uh, uh, l l let me quickly because this is long thing. So uh, I will uh, straightforward will go. The warrior Dev Narayan and Mihir Bhoj in the political rhetoric of Gujar leaders. How Gujar uh, political leadership connect with God one way, warrior Dev Narayan. And another to Mihir Bhoj, who is a sort of a medieval king. And that is interesting. And don't ask me what is true or what is, uh, you know, is, is truth or don't ask me about that. But the way they present, this is a very interesting. Uh, so far, I have shown how the genealogical connections between Gujars and their caste patron, deity, have been textualized from colonial time by Gujar scholars and how in recent time, the revival of Akshatriyanes, Marshall Weller, by nationalist and spread of Arya Samaj Hinduism have both helped Khanpur and Merit Gujars to reinforce their local sense of community as well as to change the gods they worship and how they worship them. And this is interesting because democracy is not changing itself, but this changing about the society because it's also changing gods. This is fascinating, I find. There's a new, uh, there's a rise of new gods. However, the spread of uh, nationalism has not, or Arya Samaj has not affected their political views. Gujars in Khanpur and neighborhood uh, villages are divided into some different parties. This is not so important. So uh, I read the, uh, in their meeting, there is an ex uh, uh, extract from the speeches which I have collected. So one of the speech, look at the speech, how they redefine uh, things. So. In the inaugural speech for the former president of the Akhil Bharati Gujar Mahasang reminds audience of particular virtue of their mythical ancestor and by extension of the Gujar community 
and refers to the Bhagdavat Bharat and Mahabharat period as being characterized by a democratic government by socialist flag bearer of social justice and democratic Gujars. So if one interesting part is Bhagdavat Bharat. So uh, those, uh, Professor Hada knows this because uh, uh, it's a kind of a uh, largest epic in uh, Rajasthan and how uh, Western UP Gujars have immediately picked it up as their story. So what they say, this is quote begin, Bhagavan Dev Narayan, in, uh, this is the vice president of the Akhil Bharati Gujar Mahasabha. He says, Bhagavan Dev Narayan, incarnation of Lord Vishnu, fought for the upliftment of the poor and marginalized, and he protected them. He could have become a king, being the son of a king, but he never did, and he served the poor and helped the marginalized and the victim of system. He struggled for the poor. Bhagavan Dev Narayan, descendants, are from all over, uh, all over country. The AVGM, Akhil Bharati Gujar Mahasabha, has achieved the object of bringing all Gujar of the country un under one title, Gujar. So that is the aim of this Akhil Bharati Gujar Mahasabha, bringing all the Gujar in one, under one title, they should write Gujar, not different uh, surnames. It was the Gujar Mahasabha which spread the spirit of unity within the community in the collective attempt to develop India. In the Indian history, particularly with reference to Vedic period, the Gujars had a great past, a glorious past, and Gujars were known for their bravery and administration acumen. Bhagavad uh, Bharat and Mihir Bhoj, which were the uh, which was the period of Gujar, is known for the social justice and for the government of poor and for social just uh, yeah, social justice and government of the poor. This is the Ram Sharan Bhati, who is the president, uh, vice president of the uh, Akhil Bharati, uh, Gujar Mahasabha. So the, you see the connection between. So nobody knows, uh, and, and 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 it's a very different reading of Bhagavad Bharat. This is the uh, they presenting it. Okay, look, this is how Mihir Bhose was helping poor and fighting for social justice, and same thing was uh, 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 was done by the Dev Narayan. And this is interesting how public rhetoric and these rhetorics not only us, they go into writing the, into the uh, uh, print culture. They have the magazines, journals, and this a distribution go to the villages, houses, and one can go to Gujar houses and can read that, what Devanarayan has done. So, so audience clapped and people nodded what he said. So over the years, I spent a great deal of time listening to these speeches, uh, speeches at Gujar Caste Association meetings as well as the political rallies and on these occasions I heard the above remark over and over again. Repetitiveness is hence not only a characteristic of Gujar caste historiography but also verbal political rhetoric. The ex ex excerpt of the presidential address cited here was followed by other speeches by leading Gujar political leader uh, Hukam Singh. And Hukam Singh has been one of the towering uh, uh, political leader in Western UP. So look at that, what, uh, what uh, Hukam Singh says now. Uh, he stress, uh, or he, uh, he says, how it, it is impossible to talk about Bhagdavad Bharat without Bhagavan Dev Narayan, like Mahabharat without Krishna. While Krishna was the Dwapar Yuga, incarnation of Lord Vishnu, Dev Narayan and Mihir Bhoj were the Kalki avatar of Vishnu. So how Hukam Singh weave a story in a public where thousands of people are sitting. Like Lord Vishnu, Dev Narayan challenged the evils and protected the poor and marginalized. In Mahabharata, Gujar were led by Krishna, like in Bhagavad Bharat, Gujars were led by the Dev Narayan. In each yug, epoch, Gujars have fought for justice and against any kind of exploitation. Similarly, the great King Mihir Bhoj fought and defended the Hindu dharma from the Arab invaders. Mihir Bhoj was also the incarnation of Lord Vishnu. That is why he took the title of Varha, the wild boar, and has been famous as Brahmir. Mihir Bhoj commanded an army of 36 lakh which represented 36 caste groups. This shows 
that Mihibos was not only king of uh, a king of administrative acumen, but also democratic and inclusive. This point is very inclusive. Bhoj should be worshipped and respected by all caste groups among Hindus. He represented the Sarvajan, all caste group including Dalits and OBCs. Thus, since ages, the Gujars have been at the front to saving and protecting Hindu Dharma and Brahmins, but also delivering justice to the poor and marginalized. So this is Hukum, Hukum Singh, who was a, a one time also minister uh, in, in UP and has been a very towering personality. So these are the snapshot how in a political meetings, uh, these gods and kings have been appropriated and used to connect to their past and present and the, their politics, you know, in, in a such a way that make a uh, kind of a meaning of the contemporary politics to them. Because this way is easier to them give and um, connect the public, uh, people, ordinary Gujars with the political leaders. That is what I, 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 I draw from that or, or try to reinterpret that way. A uh, little bit on the modern revolutionaries. So this was a kind of snapshot of that and then I'll you know, go quickly. So Gujar politicians, besides using selected representations of God, Devanarayan and Vishnu, also use an array of cultural and historical resources to portray contemporary Gujar as a caste traditionally committed to fighting for freedom and to protecting the weaker people against injustices. For example, the recent times, historical figures like Dhan Singh Kotwal, Rao Kadam Singh, uh, Vijay Singh Pathik, Pratav Rao Gujar, and Sardar Patel have been portrayed by the Gujar caste literature and, uh, and in the political speeches of Gujar politicians as modern Gujar heroes who com combated British imperialism in the same way the Dev Narayan fought against imperialist Vishal Dev. And Alha and Udal fought against their enemies from the kingdom of Mohaba. The deeds of these modern epic Gujar heroes cover the north and south of India and also provide evidence for the existence of culturally united all Indian Gujar community. As mentioned in chapter 2, the Gujar caste associations and political leaders have successfully established Dhan Singh Kotwal, the hero of 1857, in instead of Mangal Pandey for the Meerut rebellion. Other important freedom fighters who has been gaining public visibility in Rao Kadam Singh Gujar, the former royal of Parikshatgarh and Mawana, is said to have valorously fought against the British during the 1857, the first war of independence. Uh, so the, how Rao Kadam Singh and Ra, uh, uh, Dhan Singh Kotwal is emerging hero and they have occupied the public space and it's become a, now almost accepted in Meerut. Look, they were the real 1857 heroes. This is one of the, uh, I mean, speech uh, I, I have translated. Uh, Rao Kadam Singh, accession of the historic ruling house of Parikshitgarh, Parikshitgarh is very next to Meerut, is one of the greatest freedom, and this was the, I think, Gujar dynasty there, is one of the greatest freedom fighter of India. Kadam Singh was elected by his clansmen as their leader to fight against Britishers during the Indian rebellion of 1857. When towards the end of June, Major Williams and Dunlap led the Khaki Risala and attacked Parikshitgarh. The Gujars in the leadership of Kadam Singh dug up the old guns which were buried at Parikshitgarh during the reign of Gujar king Raja Nain Singh half a century ago and destroyed the British army post and police station of their territory. Gujars of Basuma and Enchi Willi played a major role with Rao Kadam Singh. The story of this great of Gujar is that of heroism, valor, patriotism, and self-sacrifice of the great order. With 10,000 of Gujars, Jats, and Rajput, he struggled and hard against the superior British forces in 1857. He was among the first Indians to plan to overthrow the British rule. So this is how Dhan Singh Kotwal and Rao Kadam Singh have become not only hero, in fact, not Gujars, but in fact, the, almost all communities started accepting uh, uh, their contribution to 1857. So it's a long, uh, uh, there's also uh, uh, Vijay Singh Pathik role in Rajasthan, 
and there is another lady called Dhola Gujri who in Palwal fought against Muslims during 1947. So these are the three, four, I have taken the four, uh, these heroes of 1857 and 1947. And there were diverse cases how they try to weave the story, how the Gujars have been at the front to defend the nation, defend the Hindu dharam, defend the community. And their role should be recognized. And this is how they are building their cultural resources and using to participate in politics. Last section, uh, I don't know if there is a time, but I will just try to tell the connection of how this killing of Vish Vishal Dev, a political performance of Bhagdavad Bharat, which is part of the uh, only in Rajasthan, and what kind of reform is takes in Western UP. This is very fascinating because they are not uh, doing what the, Rajast in, uh, the, the, the way performers or Bhat do in Rajasthan. They don't do this way in, in, in Western UP. They have connected it or annexed it with Ram Lila. So after Ram Lila, two days, killing of Vishal Dev, a political performance of Bhagdavad Bharat. Even many of them, they don't know even uh, Bhagdavad Bharat, but they say killing of Vishal Dev by Dev Narayan. So they, many of them, they interpret as a, as a drama. But it's interesting like how is, uh, it is uh, attracting audiences and message is going around and how, what kind of message comes, this is what, it's a little bit, uh, I will try to finish in 5-10 minutes, not many of them. Yeah. So, in, in the last 15 years, the Meerat Gujar Sammelan has organized a number of religious celebrations, which have also percolated at local level, Mawana town, Khanpur village. The Gujar Vikas Manchan, Akhil Bharati Gujar Masava, began celebrating Devnara and Leela performance every year since the 2005. In some of the previously quoted speeches, the figure of Visaldev and his battle with Devnaran has been mentioned. The Devnaran myth narrates how thousands of years ago Vishaldev killed Bhagdavat and captured their kingdom and how the grown-up Devnaran killed Vishaldev to liberate his people from an illegitimate rule. The Devnaran Leela is portrayed as the celebration of the victory of justice, uh, justice-loving and democratic Gujars over oppressive and despotic Rajputs. So this is interesting. So how they, they also play. Initially, Dev Narayan Leela was organized at Yogi Farmhouse, an extension of the Gujar Bhavan in Partapur Merit. Artists from local Ram Leela group were hired. However, a dispute emerged between the actors who played the role of Dev Narayan and Vishal Dev. Gujars objected that the Jatav actor who personified Dev Narayan this is interesting. Please note it down. So what has happened? Because there was no professional, they had whatever available and, and then they, later on they found that was Jata. And somehow some people realized how can a Jata can be our God? Because he was, he had to suppose to kill. So finally a Gujar uh, was found uh, to play the role and Devnar and Leela performance shifted from Partapur to Sastinagar. They said we want, don't want to do because there is there's no artist here. Uh, one of the promoters of the Devnaran Leela pointed out to me that with the Devnaran Leela, Gujars wished to assert that Devnaran was and is a Gujar god. And a known Gujar cannot play that role. <coughs> and when, the perf perform, uh, when they perform in the drama, they are not merely actors, but become the divine person, as Professor Purohit has told us many times, how the possessions come and they become, person become a god. Uh, you see, so they become divine person. So they know, it's not just act. You worshipped. So, following this incident in 2013, youth wings of the AVGM also began organizing Dev Narayan Leela performance as extension of Ram Leela in October November at Gujar Chowk. The Dev Narayan Leela was attended by large group of audience, and it also gave a platform to several Gujar political leaders. Hundreds of Gujars from nearby villages, including Kanpur, attended the Leela. Before the performance began, a group of Gujar political leaders always addressed the audience. So it's not just a very simple, so uh, I don't want to go to this, you know, ad address because this again, same thing. 
okay, how you know Dev Narayan did this and other this. But main thing I want to come to the main part how the these mythical or uh, divine uh, gods or person how they are related with modern political culture or modern politicians how does it connect and this is the, I think the crucial part of this research contemporary Gujar politicians are hence attributed and attribute to themselves via explicit uh, explicit links to a deified caste heroes to Devanarayan particular qualities and statecraft abilities this phenomenon is neither altogether new or nor specific to Gujars has usually been associated with contemporary reworking of Hindu models of divine kinship. So there is a lot of research on that, how, how uh, people uh, behave in politics. However, in the Gujar case, such phenomenon is reinforced by continuous uh, reference, both by ordinary people and political leaders to inherited substance as the basis of gaining divine and political skill. This is very important. It follows that local Gujar concept of personhood are central to understanding the effectiveness of Gujar political rhetoric. In particular, folk theories of source of knowledge are important to understand how local Gujars link themselves to a democratic past. In chapter 4, I showed how the uh, historic Devanarayan is more than a divine hero for Gujars. Uh, he is their ancestor. Gujar rhetoric present relatedness as rooted in descent. Essence and qualities are hence inherited from previous generation. And Gujars as descendant of Devanarayan portray the members of their community as privileged vessels of a democratic knowledge by the very fact of their ancestry. So this is very interesting. Aap kaha se seek hai politics? Ma ke pet se. That is what the point is here. Kaha se seek ka hai aap? So in Khanpur and its neighborhood, the idea that being Gujar depends on birth and that physical traits together with the skills are passed in the blood. And we all know that when we define each other, how does this feel, how does it feel, how does it feel, how does it feel, how does it feel, how it is interpreted, that we are the because we are the descendants or the ones of them, so we are the brothers. पेट से ही हमको पता चल जाता है गर्भाशय से हम पता चल जाता है कि हमें क्या करना है सो इन्फॉर्मेंट्स ऑफ्टन एक्सप्लेन देयर प्रीडिस्पोजिशन टू सक्सीड इन पॉलिटिकल गेम इज इन 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 नेट दे से दैट दे लर्न इट वूम एंड दे वर बोर्न टू बी पॉलिटिशियंस दे आल्सो इन्वॉक वूम मेटाफर व्हेन दे आंसर्ड माय क्वेरीज अबाउट अप्रेंटिसशिप स्पेशली विद रिगार्ड टू इश्यूज रिलेटिंग टू द काउ हर्डिंग प्रोफेशन एथेनो वेटनरी प्रैक्टिसेस एंड एंड particular sign language used by brokers at cattle fairs or young Gujars often told me that they learn using guns and jumping walls in mother's womb so I think it's a uh, uh, I will try to uh, bind up because I don't want to bore you uh, because it's a long uh, ethnographic work so I, I should conclude so that you get the sense and we can have a discussion uh, to sharpen my argument uh, uh, so I want to conclude that what I'm trying to do and what is the main argument uh, which is I have prepared through this ethnographic work in this book I have discussed the process of uh, localization or I can call it Indianization I know uh, many people will, will object it but I, that's why I'm choosing more carefully so localization of democratic politics that is the process through which ideas and practice of democracy become embedded in a particular cultural and social practices and in turn become entrenched in the consciousness of the ordinary people. In particular, by unraveling the caste understanding of democracy of Khanpur Gujars, I looked at how through localization popular politics thrives in UP. Democracy become localized or casteized among the members of Gujar community through idioms and practice which are the product of the encounter between popular theories of religious descent, kinship structures, marriage patterns, popular religion, ideas of masculinity, local notions of personhood, 
factionalism and the institutions and practices of Indian democracy on the other hand. I argue that dynamics between indigenous idioms of politics and global democratic discourse and practices have been the key in making a democracy part of the Indian political imagination and in forming, in forming the political rise of the marginalized group. This process is undoubtedly important when considering the success and failure of democracy to take root in different sociocultural settings. Much previous research has emphasized the role that political elite institutions and international factors play in democratic transition and democratic consolidation, but rather less attention has been paid to the role that social and cultural factors play in helping democracy to be legitimized in the eyes of ordinary people and in influencing the entr entrance of the masses into politics. The case of the Gujars, low caste or marginalized caste group, both in ritual and economic terms, that through localization has achieved through high level of politicization and assertiveness provides an alternative way to look at the popular politics. It shows that faith in democracy and deepening of democracy is not only dependent on what a state fails to succeed to deliver. In India, for example, poverty, illiteracy, corruption, disregard for law and other or an, an order and political violence coexist with a commitment to the idea of democracy among the poor and marginalized. Thank you very much. I think I took a lot of time, but I had to cut also. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Satendra. In fact, uh, I must compliment you for such a wonderful exposition of both the theory and practice of democracy. And in fact, uh, it is a new kind of interpretation. And uh, particularly when you uh, enlighten us, when you revealed that the use of cultural sources in the struggle for power and also conceptualizing power, conceptualizing democracy. That I think would be a wonderful, is a wonderful kind of contribution of your study. Another very important uh, issue that you have raised is that there's a coexistence uh, of democracy, uh, corruption and violence. In fact, uh, many modern democratic theories consider, uh, you know, poverty, corruption, and violence as the most important dangers to democracy. And they predict that uh, uh, they, they weaken democracy. And therefore, sometimes democracy might be given place to some other uh, anarchical or some kind of dictatorial kind of systems. But the most important aspect is that you have brought it out that how the, uh, in India, how uh, democracy, uh, violence, corruption, poverty, because some people say that poor people do not participate. The old democratic theories, in fact, argue that democracy is under some kind of a threat because the poorer sections, the large majority of the people withdraw themselves from the democratic process. They don't participate, but you have proved otherwise that it is not really the only thing, determinant of political participation. Another important aspect is lineage, and particularly the uh, lineage, in fact, is being used to uh, tell the audience and also the society at large <coughs> that Gujars are the community which have been fighting for justice, which has been fighting against oppression and suppression. And therefore, Gujars is the community which has been, in fact, trying to make democracy more substantive rather than merely a formal kind of a system of government Thank you for uh, giving such a wonderful uh, presentation. And now the, you, the discussion uh, is invited uh, on the presentation. Kindly introduce yourself and then ask questions. Be brief and accurate. Professor Satyendra Ji, I want to tell you about सबसे पहले तो आ, क्योंकि जिस गांव में मैं बड़ा हुआ उस गांव में लगभग 20 प्रतिशत जनसंख्या गुर्जरों की थी इसलिए मैंने उनको एक जाति से एक प्रभावशाली और निर्णायक राजनीतिक इकाई में बदलते हुए देखा बहुत प्रभावशाली ढंग से 
मैंने अपने विश्वविद्यालय में अपनी एक छात्रा से बगदावत भारत पर शोध कार्य भी करवाया और मैंने आरंभ में जब उसका प्रेजेंटेशन हुआ तब उसे ये कहा था कि ये काम सराहना और श्रद्धा के भाव से नहीं होना चाहिए लेकिन उस बच्ची का बार बार कहना ये था कि यदि ये मैं नहीं करूंगी तो मैं जाति दायरे से बाहर आ जाऊंगी इसलिए उसने वो जो कार्य किया वो श्रद्धा और सराहना के भाव से किया एक बात दूसरी बात मुझे जो कहनी है वो ये है कि भारतीय राजनीति और प्रजातांत्रिक प्रक्रिया को आप जिस तरह से समझते हैं स्थानीयकरण से ही बेहतर ढंग से समझा जा सकता है ये मुझे लगता है कि यही एक प्रक्रिया इसका अच्छा उदाहरण मैं देता हूं जो आपने भी कहा है अब जो विधायक या सांसद का चुनाव लड़ने वाले जो लोग हैं जैसे गुर्जर हैं तो वो छोटे छोटे गांवों में हाथ में पानी देकर देव नारायण की शपथ दिलाते हैं देव नारायण की शपथ नहीं दिलवाते वो कई बार जो बिल्कुल स्थानीय है भैरों जी है या कोई है देवता है उनकी शपथ दिलाते हैं छोटे छोटे ग्रुप्स में और बड़े बड़ा जो प्रचार तंत्र होता है बड़ी सभाएं अब उतनी कम होने लगी है खासतौर पर बंद जातियों में इसलिए मुझे लगता है कि ये भारतीय राजनीति और प्रजातांत्रिक प्रक्रिया का एक नया चेहरा बल्कि ये सही चेहरा अब धीरे धीरे सामने आ रहा आप जैसे लोगों को आ, आ, ये साहस करना चाहिए एक बात और मैं जो कहना चाह रहा हूं कि वो ये कि गुर्जर विष्णुई और जाट और ये जो बंद जातियां जिन जातियों का दूसरी जातियों के साथ संवाद और अंतर क्रिया कम है वे जातियां भारतीय राजनीति में खास तौर पर ज्यादा निर्णायक और प्रभावी हो रही है आश्चर्यजनक ये है बहुत मतलब ये इस बात पर विचार किया जाना चाहिए कि ऐसा क्यों हो रहा है वे जातियां जो जिनकी दूसरी जातियों के साथ संवाद नहीं है दूसरी जातियों के साथ अंतर क्रिया नहीं है वे एक मुश्त वोट डालते हैं पूरे के पूरे समाज पर इसलिए इस बात पर ये भारतीय राजनीति का नया स्वरूप नया चेहरा सामने धीरे धीरे आएगा मैं आपको बधाई देना चाहता हूं मुझे लगता है भारतीय राजनीति भारतीय प्रजातांत्रिक प्रक्रिया और बल्कि भारतीय संस्कृति को भी मुझे लगता है वो एक एक स्थानीय परिप्रेक्ष्य में ही बेहतर ढंग से समझा जा सकता है मैं मैं आपको आप यदि गुर्जर कहेंगे तो जो गुर्जर राजस्थान में है एक सांस्कृतिक इकाई के रूप में ये जैसे आपने जो देव भगवान देव नारायण का जिक्र किया है मुझे लगता है दूसरी जातियां भी अपने देवताओं को उसी तरह विष्णु का अवतार सिद्ध करने के प्रयास में लगी हुई है जैसे एक बहुत ताजा उदाहरण अभी अभी का बाबा रामदेव को विष्णु का अवतार सिद्ध करने का अभियान शुरू हो गया है और इस इस संबंध में साहित्य भी प्रकाशित हो गया है बहुत बहुत बधाई बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर धन्यवाद ये जो दो बात बस जोड़ ही रहा हूँ लेकिन आपने बहुत साहस बधाया इस बात को कहकर कि ये जो इसको बिना समझे ये जो आप कह रहे कि ये केवल एक जाति की बात नहीं है ये लगभग जो जो भी विजिबल जातियां हैं और या नॉन विजिबल भी हैं जो रोल ऑफ रिलीजन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट जो हम लोग लगातार उसको नेग्लेक्ट करते रहते हैं किसी बहाने से या कोई हम लोग हम भी अंग्रेजी पढ़े मतलब लेकिन अंग्रेजी में कई दायरे होते हैं पढ़ने लिखने के तो उसमें हमें रिलीजन से का कभी कभी दिक्कत होती है हम लोग डरते हैं उसके बारे में लेकिन रिलीजन का बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट रोल है आवाज गई आवाज नहीं आ रही है अश्वनी जी कुछ गड़बड़ हो गया शायद सर सर की आवाज नहीं आ रही है क्या नाम है इसका सर आवाज नहीं आई थी बीच में हाँ रिलीजन कहेंगे तो वो एक ब्रॉड स्पेक्ट्रम टर्म होगी 
जो रिलीजन का भी जो स्थानीय रूप है exactly. उस पर उस पर एकाग्र करना चाहिए मुझे लगता है कि रिलीजन का भी जैसे आ, आप आप कहेंगे कि रिलीजन तो रिलीजन कहते ही बहुत ब्रॉड स्पेक्ट्रम टर्म होगी बहुत स्थानीय छोटी छोटी चीजें राजस्थान में ऐसे मैं राजस्थान के बहुत सारे उदाहरण दे सकता हूँ जिनमें बिल्कुल स्थानीय देवता बिल्कुल स्थानीय देवता आपके चुनाव में निर्णायक भूमिका निभा रहे प्रजातंत्र में निर्णायक भूमिका निभा रहे वेरी स्ट्राइकिंग फीचर ऑफ योर प्रेजेंटेशन was this idea about how the institution of caste has transformed under democratic pressure so it's not a static institution you cannot be i mean it is uh, completely illogical to think of it as a static institution but this is a very clear demonstration of how the institution changes under a variety of social pressure for example with a change to a democratic system and i was just wondering whether this thesis i like that thesis uh, very much and whether it can be extended backwards and so on uh, to see what uh, exactly uh, 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 to see the way in which uh, the entire caste system evolved its trajectory through his and that's a big it's not part of maybe your book now but it is a project which you should perhaps uh, think of or maybe if somebody has done please inform me about it because i am not well informed about it uh thank you sir uh, yes it, this is not part of me but i think the, the but i am trying to uh, say something similar what you are suggesting uh that's why it's uh, easy to connect ki the institution uh is not static and you can see throughout the history whatever literature is available but there is also tendency which in we try to intentionally try to fossilize the cast or you know a particular so i will add uh, two things uh, and, and and i'll continue have a, a dialogue with you and on that i'm not aware if somebody has done that but two things like for instance what is important and how we can reach if we more focus on regional stages was harda sahab was saying regional stages then can give us a more interesting uh, data and understanding how a caste system has been changing uh, over the years for example i i, I have two examples to give if we take the uh, into account of the western up which has a different caste structure and we will take the eastern up we'll find is a huge difference experience of dalit in western up and the very different experience in eastern up and it's because of the structure of land colonial legacy and even pre colonial uh, muslim zamindari and the and the nawabi system so you know it will be interesting like most of dalits have a land there the land owners if you go to eastern up uh, they have very little land so and that is a huge difference when you talk dalits in western up and eastern up and so what i'm trying to say this kind of homogenization and universalization of experience and fossilizing is very dangerous sometime it is obscure our understanding about the changing institutions and cultures and you know all sort of because these are changing entities i do so i think it's very helpful what you are suggesting and thank you Thank you for your answer. Yes, Professor M P Singh. Yes, sir. Then I'll come to you. Professor M P Singh was raising his hand. Uh, it's a fascinating study in anthropology. But as a political scientist, I'm dissatisfied with. Uh, Aristotle called politics. Politics of the master. 
Aristotle called politics and master science. Karl Marx made economics as master science. And now anthropologists are making anthropology as master science. And politics is being elbowed out of the disciplinary ground. Uh, uh, Professor Satan Kumar has very closely analyzed uh, anthropology of a local caste, the Gujas, uh, and he started out by saying that, that he will analyze interaction between caste or folk culture on the one hand and politics on the other. I find political institutions totally missing from this study. Uh, politics is just referred to in absentia, so to say. And uh, there is hardly any mention of political culture, highly, high, uh, hardly any analysis of political, new political culture that emerging, except for culture already. And folk culture is being given a kind of mastery that I cannot imagine uh, in a functioning democracy like India, where uh, you know the uh, constitutional institutions, uh, institutions established under law, institutions established under the constitution, uh, would not have any efficacy, would not have any effect. So, uh, you know, it's a wonderful analysis of anthropology, but not of political anthropology. Uh, you know, politics must come, political process and political institutions must come in as interacting partners rather than absent partners or sleep, not even sleeping, absent partners. That's my major uh, dissatisfaction, although the study is highly appreciable, my view, from the anthropological point of view. As a multidisciplinary work, uh, it needs rethinking. Uh, uh, sir, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. This is a very, very important comment, and uh, I can, uh, I will try to answer it partly, and on, and then uh, in due course, I can also try answer this. So one. Uh, missing of political institutions. This is a very important point, actually. So now issue comes, uh, how anthropologists deal with politics. This is, and I begin with, uh, I try to that, in political science, there is a due, uh, is an emphasis on political institutions is, I think, uh, uh, because of uh, modern politics, has been overemphasized. That is my understanding. I may be wrong, and so I'm not denying that taking into account the political institution. So and what we the political institution? Another question is that and how we deal with it. So one of the chapters I tried to do is how people participate. Uh, so because I could not present here, so it's a chapter number. Uh, so that in future we can have a discussion. So chapter 6, no, 5th, I have tried to show how Gujars engage with three levels of political institutions. One is village level, panchayat institutions. Second is block level. And third is uh, legislative assembly so i intentionally did not took the lok sabha because i thought it's a bit too much for me so what i try to make it is regional uh, study 
So these are three layers of institution. I said how they engage these institutions and how they reinterpret uh, the, uh, the participation. So it's not that entirely missing. I could not present here. No, the things, the point is very clear now. That is, you know, if you if you have mentioned them, perhaps that question so, might so, not have come. So because it was such a, you know, my high, half an hour has gone already. So I thought yes. I just give a conclusion on that. So it is there, you know. So thank you, sir, again. And it is not merely political institutions, but uh, political science is also concerned with political processes. That's why I say political process and, and political you know. recruitment as well. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Patel. Me? Are you aware? Are you? Most important. I mean, it's a wonderful presentation, and I like that. Uh, but I would like to pose some questions. Uh, in order to get something more out of you. <laughs> and uh, towards that, I think what Professor M. P. Singh has said is extraordinarily important for you, uh, not only to uh, refer to what is everything in one chapter, but also in the entire uh, entire reading of your, your, your entire process of democracy and the prospects of democracy, this politics has to be brought in. And that 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 should be that should be a running thread. I mean, and that is important. And uh, I was tempted to uh, come in uh, because of Professor Paranjpe's comment that when he contrasts between uh, American case and Indian democracy democratic case, in America it is individual. At individual level, you rise and fall. But in India, it is it is the caste or group. And that is the key. And that is the key where democracy has to be probed further. Why democracy is becoming such kind of uh, space where, I mean, it, it, it provides a challenge for, for any social scientist, where we are unable to understand the reactions of people or the voting pattern, whatever kind of, uh, whatever kind of methodology we use, we are unable to understand that, and that's, that's this unpredictability is what makes any uh, election analysis extremely important and extremely engaging. And here, Professor Hara's comment is very important, I believe, where he he says that saying that religion has a role is not enough. You have to look down and see various aspects of religion. And those very those so many aspects are not known to the Western scholars. Therefore, they always refer to religion. They always try to deal with their own kind of tools, and therefore they get confused. And that is where Satyendra Singh's uh, Satyendra Kumar's work can be very important, which can actually give us real kind of feedback from the ground level, so as to so as to uh, inform us in a better way to understand the people's political behavior. This is something which obviously you can relate to, and we have a large number of discussions in between because I have the privilege of being your roommate, and so we have a long discussion. We have long discussions over it. But I would like to draw your attention to one thing which troubles me a lot, and that is uh, that is the loss of the ideal, which is which is. Uh, as a historian, I feel very sorry about that there was some kind of mobilization done before independence. There was some kind of mobilization done between 47 and 77. And in both these times, you have, you have mobilization keeping in the mind the broad unity, a greater unity. I, 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 I know that caste was important even in those days and between 47 and 77. But this politics had the potentiality to relate to something higher, something bigger. 
and that is something which is getting missed in this in this new kind of the new kind of mobilization so this i mean you can think of gandhi you can think of jay prakash narayan i was thinking of jay prakash narayan there was a time i mean you are you are very familiar with that and i'm 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 aware that i am going too far from your actual work but i would like to draw your attention that even in this kind of a local study when you talk about the making of a new god making of new kind of strategies to bring their own people together which you say that manch politics who are on the manch and what, what what kind of interactions going on between the local <laughs> leader local symbols and local people i i i i i think that that's a very wonderful input that is coming from from researcher side but does it mean that the scope for idealism or scope for a broader unity is somewhat getting sacrificed in this kind of empowerment of the people or is there any still some some kind of a scope that people are still remembering those things when they are voting or when they are taking part in the in, in the in the in the political process and uh, in, uh, 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 uh professor raju has brought in one important aspect of it the changing uh caste i think changing democracy is also very important what we expect from democracy and how an academic can help us to get back to the, the to the to the to the essence of democracy which may not be fully understandable to the common people but as an academic we try to open up that that aspect of democracy which can help us to uh, understand why people are not connected to something broader something higher otherwise it's all glooming it's all all becomes somewhat kind of a mechanical mobilization mechanical kind of management of political power i think people have something more than that what meets our eyes people have something more and that has to be digged out and this kind of honest endeavor may help us to find out why people are not going against religion one and they are not going against the country nowhere they are seen as going against their country and that is very important why this kind of uh, politics politicization is still caring for nationalism and religious morality these are the questions which i would like to draw your attention otherwise i have loved this presentation and i am familiar that it's a wonderful presentation thank you very much thank you sir these are very very important questions and particularly you have raised very uncomfortable questions also see one thing uh, i want to uh, say uh, i mean uh, we uh, allow me to talk after also the presentation and this response uh, only one or two things i'll try to say something about one is the politics actually so you see this is a very interesting development in political uh, anthropology and uh, political sociology politics is the way uh, one way of looking politics is a uh is a convey uh, i mean which is pertinent will you know fight for resources participating you know in, in the decision making and also to have a uh, power positions you fight for that competition there is a recent development they call it the political we don't call it a politics how we uh we define what is the political and this is a one needs to pay attention and this is a, a, a kind of the crux of this uh, uh, this uh, story which i am trying to tell ki politics and the political need to be connected together this is one of the contribution of this story second part is a uh, gloominess i think we are living in gloomy world so it depends on how gloomy you are so it depends on that like in india two narratives are going on today they are very important narratives and they don't meet meet with each other each other 
One is that there is no democracy in India. Another is saying there is a democracy in India. Who to believe? It's a, it's a complex question. I can't answer and you very much know it. So it's a, so uh, how to understand not from a perspective from an academician. What advantage I have as an anthropologist, I try to bring the story what people say. You see now, which people say? People is not here abstract. A particular people, a particular caste who live in a particular setting, what they're trying to say about democracy. You see, and then from there, I'm trying to launch myself. Look, this is how. So it's not a abstract uh, and uh, you say democracy is not there and democracy is there. It also depends how people define engage with the democracy and I find this perspective more charming I'm not saying other perspectives are not but as an anthropologist I find it this is my also kind of a, a skill how people engage with these institutions of so and another story which you keep asking is what to do with the ideals and, and development is a, is a very important story without knowing the development I can't answer this. It, 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 I need to go for a long, you know, I have to take a long road to explain that, why there is no idealism. Actually, if everything change, Professor Patel, idealism is also change. May I, may I add to uh, what you are saying, Dr. Satin? Please, sir. Uh, Dr. Patel raised uh, very pertinent questions in his uh, observations. And two things which he is, uh, said that why uh, they don't uh, you know, oppose religion or why uh, they are not uh, uh, talking something else. I think so far as my little understanding of Indian society is concerned, I believe that religion has been a language of nationalism in India, not only today, but right in, in the freedom struggle as well. Religion has been used as a language of nationalism. And therefore, nationalism and religion are not contradictory mutually. They are mutually reinforcing kind of cultural uh, systems. And uh, uh, another thing which you have uh, uh, pointed out is the ideal and that is I think the most important thing as to in fact Indian society is a very complex society and even the individual castes are not that simple there are several contradictions within one single caste and community as well there are sub communities there are sub castes and they have their own interests so there are some somewhere the conflict of interest even within the same caste how are they interacting with the broader uh, aims and objectives of the uh, of the single caste, say for example, users? That also, I think, uh, needs to be taken into account. And I think uh, uh, Professor Satyendra Singh also said that uh, they don't go against religion, and he added that they don't go against the nation or nationalism. So that part is also to be explored. Uh, nationalism uh, is a phenomenon uh, which is understood in traditional as in modern terms. For primordialist nation has existed right from the ancient times for modernist nation is a product of modern times and in India they say that nationalism is a product of the British advent of the British or the first war of independence when patriotism forced itself upon the country as nationalism and Savarkar has tried to, he has, he has done a very subtle reinterpretation of Hinduism as a religion and he tried to transform it into Hinduism as a nationalism. And 
the Hindutva has tried to make transition from ethnicity to nationalism easier because he says that anyone belonging to any religion, if he identifies with the land between the Himalayas and the Russians, and one, one regards India as Pitrihumi, as well as Bunyabhumi, and uh, both doesn't say that Bunyabhumi is uh, confined for any religion in India. I have to read the Hindutva very carefully, very carefully, and he doesn't confine Pitrihumi to India as well. So, Kavarta has done a very a subtle reinterpretation of religion as nationalism. Thank you. And now, since we are running short of time, only one question can be asked. One more question. Can I ask a few, make a few comments? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sir, uh, first I'll say I really enjoyed it and it was very uh, enlightening to me. Uh, and that briefly I will make a few comments. I think uh, what Professor Hitendra Patel was making was an important point that this post-90 uh, assertion of uh, caste identities has also to be situated in the context of globalization. Uh, there is a lot of literature on how uh, local and pre Power cut, sir. You have lost your democratic voice. Oh, it has come back. Come back, come back. Has come come back. back. Has come back. India will never lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy is Jindabad, so it will never, we will never lose it. <laughs> yes, Professor Pranjpe. No, no, it was Subramanian. Ah, okay. Professor Subramanian? Again, the... Uh, since he seems to have gone out permanently, may I add a quick one line? Sure. I think what Professor Patel, yeah, what Professor Patel was saying, I think the issue is not idealism. I think the correct way to put it would be purposiveness. Yes. So, for example, during the independence struggle, there was a purpose, common purpose that everybody had. And that common purpose then leads to a very constructive process of evolution, which uh, becomes absent if you just have people fighting without any larger purpose to propel them forward. So this purposiveness is uh, very, I define it in a special way, I won't go into that, but just think of it in the normal course. And I think that should be a part of democracy. I think that is a valid point that he makes and how to have that under this circumstance. Not very clear. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is very helpful. Your clarification, that is very important. So uh, I should bind up now and thank you. Thank you all thank you. for being here and also for contributing with your comments and observations. And once again, thank you, Dr. Satyendra. Akumar, thank you sir. for an excellent kind of uh, thank you. Uh, revelation of your research and thank presentation. You, thank you. Thank and you, Professor sir. Raju, you should come back and join us. We are missing you. Let's see. Let's see if I can manage. Yes, sir. But stay healthy and safe. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. And I also join Satyendra in wishing you safe stay. In the house, yes, let's hope so. Delhi is very dangerous now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Please come back, sir. Yes. Please yeah. come back. <laughs> hey, Professor Burmanyam has... Uh, oh, is it? Okay. He has lost his democratic voice permanently.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.